in lowering the cost of doing business in Vermont. I'll now invite Commissioner Pichek to elaborate on how we were able to see such significant decreases. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here with you today to share some great news uh, that relates to Vermont uh, employees and employers uh, and explain some of the great work that our department staff has done over the last five months or so. Uh, as you may know, the worker compensation system in Vermont traces its origins back to 1915 and operates under three fundamental principles. Uh, that employees are injured on the job, should be compensated reasonable medical uh, expenses and also for wage replace replacement. Uh, that employer compensation system is the exclusive remedy for employees that are injured on the workplace uh, and that all employers uh, must cover their employees with worker compensation insurance. Now this last prong uh, is particularly difficult for smaller businesses and new businesses and businesses looking to expand. The cost of worker compensation insurance uh, can be uh, prohibiting, uh, particularly in some iconic high risk industries in Vermont like dairy farming uh, and log hauling. This is why the rate reduction that went into effect this week uh, is such welcome news for businesses across the state. This year, the department took a fresh look at the rate filing. Uh, we hired a new actuarial firm that brought new perspective, uh, brought new ideas, uh, that our department uh, vetted and in most parts accepted. Uh, as the governor said, this resulted in a 3.7% per reduction in voluntary loss costs, uh, additionally a 7.6% reduction in the voluntary market. But that 7.6% uh, reduction in the voluntary market was supplemented by an additional 6.7% reduction uh, due to an elimination of a surcharge that our actuary recommended and our department approved. So in total, we see a 14.6% reduction in that voluntary loss or that assigned risk market. And the reason that assigned risk market is so important is because that's where individuals that can't get insurance through the voluntary market, they may be new businesses, startup businesses, they may be small businesses looking to expand, or they may be these businesses operating in high risk industries. So these are people that are gonna get serious relief uh, from uh, worker compensation insurance costs. Uh, one of the things that we wanna highlight beyond just the $10 million that we'll save this year is that when you combine with the rate reduction from last year, Vermont employers will be, will be spending $30 million less in worker compensation premiums uh, than they did uh, in 2016. Uh, mentioning these high risk industries for a minute, uh, our work uh, focusing on logging uh, and some other high risk industries this summer along with Sam Lincoln who did an excellent job uh, presenting these issues uh, to us uh, and advocating uh, for the logging community. Uh, the governor mentioned a dramatic uh, decrease in the log uh, hauler uh, class code. Uh, this was from the great work of our department uh, and our actuary. Uh, they discovered a way uh, that we could combine the log hauling class code with a larger trucker class code. That would mean that Vermont uh, was able to rely on our own experience, that we didn't have to rely on a melting of experience from national uh, carriers, a national industry. Uh, and because our experience was so good here in Vermont, uh, that's what resulted in this dramatic 24% reduction in log haulers. So I want to thank the great work of Deputy Commissioner Chris Rulo, Kevin Gaffney, and Phil Keller, uh, as well as Jill Rickard, who's here from our department, uh, who worked very hard on a work, worker compensation study uh, and also worked very hard uh, on this uh, rate filing. Uh, a special mention, and Sam will mention this, but the worker compensation work group uh, is something that was also established in the last few months that's looking at ways that we can improve workplace safety uh, in these high-risk class codes, uh, particularly in the logging class code, mechanized, non-mechanized logging, uh, the sawmill industry as well. Uh, we'll take uh, what we've learned from other states in northern New England, like Maine, uh, where they have seen dramatic decreases uh, in worker compensation premiums due to much safer work uh, environments. So with that, I also want to thank NCCI that worked uh, with us during the process. I want to thank the VIAA and Mary Eversall and her agents and her members uh, that do a great job of educating businesses uh, as to their responsibilities for worker compensation insurance and ensuring that workplaces become safer. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, that workplace safety is the key to reducing the rates uh, in Vermont. Uh, the Department of Labor has done excellent efforts in this regard, both with their enforcement efforts and then also with their project WorkSafe efforts. So with that, I want to invite Commissioner Curley to come up and explain a little bit more about that. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Um, as both Commissioner Pichek and the Governor explained, safe and healthy workplaces contribute greatly to the reduction in workers' compensation insurance costs. Current data shows, on average, Workers' comp insurance companies pay out nearly $60,000 per claim in wage replacement and medical expenses over the life of a claim. 
In the past few, few years, Vermont, in Vermont, we have seen a decrease in the number of first reports of injury, as well as the number of lost time claims filed with the Vermont Department of Labor. The decline reflects a growing commitment on the part of Vermont employers to put in place effective safety and health management systems in the workplace, emphasize, emphasizing a cooperative management and workforce commitment to preventing injuries. Enforcement and consultation also play an important contributory role in helping to achieve the reduction in serious injuries. In addition to the commitment of employers, which is an important tool in the declining trend of worker injury, the state's Occupational Safety and Health Administration Program, or VOSHA as most of you know it, has proven another tool that has, been, that has greatly reduced the number of work-related injuries and fatalities occurring in Vermont. By providing compliance, assistance, education, and through our voluntary Project WorkSafe program, we've been able to work with employers at their request to provide assistance in identifying and correcting workplace ha hazards. Project WorkPlace provides safety audits, program development, chemical exposure assessments, and noise monitoring at the voluntary request of the employer, and services are free and confidential. Reducing costs, keeping a safe and healthy workplace can help increase productivity, improve and increase employee morale, and enable a company to win over and retain their employees. Additionally, as we look to grow our labor force in Vermont, investing in safe and healthy workplaces is an important strategy that will allow us to attract more families to our communities and the jobs that we have available here. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Lincoln. Thank you, Commissioner Curley. Uh, workers' compensation insurance in Vermont's forest economy can be prohibitively expensive, uh, with rates ranging from $19 to $51 per $100 of payroll. From 2012 to 2016, those rates rose 60%. Uh, and thankfully they've plateaued at this time and are starting to decrease. Uh, this can cause those who work in Vermont's most dangerous and one of its most important occupations to work alone in our most remote places. Employers who have the insurance find the cost to be unsustainable, particularly when there's been a significant market collapse for low-grade forest products. Vermont is a small state with a small number of small businesses and there are times that this can be a disadvantage when it comes to insurance. The change to the log hauler class code addresses a complicated rate making formula that has kept uh, rates high for these employers even when this occupation has had a notably positive safety record. By implementing a common sense solution, merging log hauling with contract trucking, we have this significant 24% reduction in rates. Our department is actively engaged in efforts to address the root causes of high rates for other occupations in the forest economy, including plans for enhanced safety training, uh, verifications that the safe practices have been implemented at job sites, and ensuring that the contractors hold the proper insurance. Our overarching goal is to increase the number of employees under the protection of workers' compensation insurance, making sure they are better trained and working at safer job sites. When combined, these efforts will sustainably lower rates and reduce one of the well-known barriers to employment growth in this sector. The department has received support in this effort from Governor Scott, the other departments mentioned within the administration, the legislature, logger training programs, not just in Vermont, from, but from organizations in Maine, New York, New Hampshire, and all who have lent their expertise to us, and we are grateful to them all. I'll turn it back over to Governor Scott. Um, are there any questions about uh, the issue of the workers' compensation rates? Uh, does anyone have data showing that work, work sites have gotten safer either through injuries or fatalities? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, so uh, I have with me Steve Monaghan, who oversees uh, our safety work, work, uh, workers' compensation safety division. We do have that information. We don't have it on hand with us, but we would be happy to provide that with you. But we do have data that's showing that the trend's coming down. So it's not just the administrative tinkering that's safe. Vermont employees are actually safer. Absolutely. We have data that shows that, for sure. And if we can continue that trend, you know, hopefully everybody will jump on board and continue to help us bring those costs down. Other questions? Workers' comp. <laughs> <laughs> oh the good news is it's fun. I know, I know. For you guys. Yeah. 
No, they've worked really hard uh, to provide for this, and uh, I think our Vermont employers and employees have done the same, and I think that's really important to emphasize. So with that, I'm sure we're going to move on to some other questions, and you're free to uh, move along if you'd like. Governor, you can stay right there if you'd like. Governor, your administration got a letter from the EPA uh, concerning water quality, and it said, it's important that the state establish a long-term revenue source, since this is critical to successful and full implementation of the TMDL. So what's your plan for establishing a long-term revenue source? Well, again, I think if you read the rest of the letter, I mean, I, I know that's one uh, point they made, but I think there was a, a fairly a glowing uh, type of uh, uh, letter uh, saying that we we're doing a lot of good things in Vermont. And uh, in fact, they gave us a, an extension in uh, another area. Um, we, uh, I'm committed, as I've said multiple times, committed to water quality. Um, but uh, the details matter. We put forth, uh, we have a plan put together that, uh, that will, a short-term plan that puts us uh, through the next couple of years. Um, I believe, still believe that growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, and, and growing revenues organically are going to give us uh, the, the money that we need, uh, the resources needed uh, for continued uh, water quality issues. Uh, but I don't think the knee-jerk reaction should just necessarily be to just add another fee. Maybe there's a way to reduce uh, spending in other areas and, and incorporate uh, another uh, fee structure in itself or another tax. So uh, I'm fully committed uh, to water quality issues and cleaning up our, our lakes and streams. Uh, but I don't, uh, don't believe uh, that we uh, have uh, to uh, put forth a fee at this point in time. Would you do it in the future? Well, possibly, but as I said, I believe uh, that we uh, have the means uh, to uh, we, look what we've done this year. Last year, we, we had a budget that didn't raise taxes and fees. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced we can do it again this year. And, uh, and we, uh, at the same time, are spending $82 million more in our budget through organic uh, growth in revenue. And I believe that we can do the same. I also uh, believe uh, that we uh, are not finished uh, with the, uh, the Massachusetts uh, uh, agreement uh, through uh, the conduit of uh, renewable power through Lake Champlain. Uh, and I think they'll eventually come back to us, and, and if not them, someone else. So that's another uh, source of funding that I believe that we can use for uh, lake cleanup. So what do, you, what do you know about the power that makes you say that? Well, they've, they've, Northern Pass is done, as you, I believe, reported on Channel 3. Um, so I believe uh, that's off the table. I know there's another one uh, that they have uh, considered, but they don't have all their uh, permits uh, lined up. Uh, and we do. I mean, that's what I uh, continue to tell uh, Governor Baker. Uh, some, sometime uh, you'll be back to us because we have all the permits in place. See, but you don't have any knowledge. No, I don't have any, any knowledge uh, that would tell I mean, me. You're still looking at that main project, right? That's right. That's right. You know when you're going to sign uh, S55 to gun legislation and whether you'll do that? Before. Well, uh, again, uh, technically, uh, we don't have that bill or uh, 221 or 422 at this point. Uh, my hope is that we will have those in the very near future. Uh, and then we'll have five days uh, to, uh, to move forward. My plan would be, uh, if everything goes right, to have all three bills and have one signing of all three. Would that be a public signing? Yes. Senator Ash is considering a tax on opiate, prescription opiates to raise some money to pay for treatment and addiction and that sort of thing. Does that concept make any sense to you? Well, I haven't seen any details. I've heard rumor uh, of this and read about it uh, through some of uh, your sources. Uh, but I haven't seen any details about, about what they plan to do with the money that they're raising. Uh, as you may recall, uh, a week or two ago, uh, we had a, a bit of a press conference announcing a $28 million settlement uh, with tobacco. Uh, $14 million of that is going to go to opioids. Uh, so uh, maybe some of that money could go towards uh, the initiative that they're uh, trying to, to fulfill. Um, as well, uh, the federal government passed a, a budget uh, that is including, has included uh, money for opioids as well. And we're not sure about the detail. So, what I'd like to do is uh, find out what they want to do with the money first, the goals. Maybe we can agree on the goals and find a, a source of funding that we already have. So it, it sounds like you don't really think it's necessary. 
Well, opioid, the opioid crisis is uh, something that uh, is on clarify. front and center. It seems like you're saying it's passed. Oh, yeah. Well, I just don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I just haven't seen any details about uh, how much this would raise or, or what their plans are uh, with, the, with the funds. And obviously, we don't want to just raise a tax for no reason. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a, a, a viable plan to put forward. But as I remember, we have 14 million uh, that we have to, or that we plan to use uh, towards uh, opioids. I think the point would be to have an ongoing source so that you could actually establish programs rather than the 14 million is going to be used up in a year or two or the house is proposing four. So that makes it hard to like set up something that might have to go away in a few years. But again, uh, we've been uh, spending a great deal of, of resources at this point in time using uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, uh, and as well uh, with some of the money uh, from the federal government that we, uh, I'm not quite sure and I'm not clear as to where that money can go or be utilized for. And for the federal government to, uh, to give us more latitude, more flexibility is going to be important. Uh, we testified on that fact uh, just about a month ago. And, uh, and I believe that Congress will react to that uh, because we're not the only state. We're just a little bit further ahead than most. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, I believe uh, that we have, uh, we've been doing uh, uh, a good job working together uh, in trying to solve this crisis. How do you feel about sending Vermont National Guard troops to the Mexican border? Um, we have, there has been no request for us to send any uh, troop, National Guard troops, uh, to anywhere at this point uh, to, to the uh, border with Mexico. Well, how do you feel about the concept? I mean, if you, if you were <coughs> asked, is that something that you would comply with? Well, we would consider anything, obviously. Uh, that's uh, what we do uh, if there's a, a crisis somewhere. Uh, we would consider that request. Um, I don't, uh, I, I see, uh, I've watched this issue and it appears that the uh, four states that have been uh, uh, have requested uh, their help uh, are right on the border. So I don't anticipate us being asked uh, to, to uh, commit any troops. Um, I, I'm not sure that that would be uh, something that we would be eager to respond to. Do you, do you, you mentioned crisis, do you think this on the border is a crisis? Well, they know better than, than I do. Uh, obviously, uh, we, uh, we're fairly north of the Mexico border, and uh, the other states are, are, are living and breathing that, so it's for them to determine. So you said it's, it's not something that you would be eager to respond to? Would not uh, be eager to right. respond to sending our National Guard uh, to the, the Mexico border. And why is that? Well, I, I, again, I think it's outside of our realm, realm our geographical area, when there are other uh, National Guard uh, troops that are much closer uh, than we are. So you haven't been contacted by the Department of Defense? We have not. Or Homeland Security or anybody else? Yeah, we have you not have received. said that they're coordinating with others. Yeah, we have not uh, received any requests uh, from the federal government on, on any deployment in regards to the uh, Mexico border. But back to the guns, do you think anything is needed beyond S55, 221, and H422? Uh, in terms of, uh, of the violence issue, uh, that the underlying violence issue, yes. Uh, I don't believe that it's, uh, it's necessarily the gun, uh, that this is uh, uh, an issue that we're all facing, uh, and uh, it's going to take uh, a lot of uh, additional steps, which I'll highlight in, uh, in my remarks uh, at the signing. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee is talking about uh, school resources officers, armed school resource officers. What, I know that's something you spoke about before, but what would you ideally like to have that look like? Well, again, we've, uh, in my action plan, uh, after the, we, uh, the averted um, horrific incident in, in uh, Fairhaven and after Parkland, uh, part of my action plan was to do an assessment on the schools. Uh, that's been completed. I look, I'm looking forward to those results. Uh, I should have them in the next week or so uh, to determine uh, where we go from here. Uh, and the legislature has been very cooperative in, uh, in uh, 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 carving out some funding, four million out of the capital bill. We'll uh, find some other resources for the additional one million. So we'll have five million um, to uh, do something sooner rather than later uh, in terms of our schools. Um, 
at that point, uh, after we get through these signings, uh, I committed as part of my action plan uh, to, uh, to providing for a task force uh, that is going to look at these very issues uh, so that we can move forward and, uh, and determine other ways to keep our communities and our, and our schools safe. Uh, resource officers could be part of that. But it'll be a, a broad group uh, of about 15 uh, members with different perspectives, and we'll, we'll take a look at this. Um, Russell Barr missed his own uh, deadline, as it were, for uh, proving allegations or giving evidence of allegations of state official uh, sex and minor crimes. Um, do you have any plans of pursuing this further, or are you willing to sort of let it drop in this? Well, again, the, uh, these are serious uh, allegations uh, that were made. I look forward uh, to, uh, it doesn't mean that he hasn't, isn't going to provide them, but we look forward uh, to seeing what he has uh, so we can determine whether to move forward uh, with this or not. Would you make any efforts on your own volition to uh, find out whether again, uh, this I, is passive? Right. I, again, I don't think it's being passive. I think we look back and there was a, an internal internal investigation completed. Into specific trick, but not into sort of anything like that. Um, I, again, I, I don't know what we would be searching for. Uh, nothing was turned up in our internal investigation. Uh, Barring uh, Mr. Barr um, providing any details, uh, I'm just not sure what we'd be looking for. Back to the school issue for a second. Are you at all concerned that schools are going to be these armed fortresses uh, and, and how that impacts the students? Well, again, I, I'm concerned uh, about that, uh, but it, my primary concern is keeping our kids safe. Uh, so that, uh, from my standpoint, we, do, uh, we need to do whatever we can provide for the safety of our, our kids uh, so that, uh, as I've said uh, other t uh, at other times, uh, they shouldn't be afraid to go to school. And, and our parents shouldn't be afraid to, uh, to send their kids, uh, put them on the bus to go to school. So we have to do whatever we can uh, in the interim uh, to make sure that our kids are safe and then start addressing this underlying uh, issue, whatever it is that's driving uh, the violence. <coughs> How important is it to you that the next education secretary have expertise in education management as opposed to other types of backgrounds that they might come with? Well, having an education background is important, obviously. Uh, but I, uh, as I detailed, the, the State Board of Education had reached out and asked that we provide, that I provide, uh, some sort of parameters. What am I looking for in the next secretary? And uh, from my standpoint, as you, if you've seen the way I've built my team uh, in the administration, uh, secretaries and commissioners that come from all walks of life with management experience. And I think that that's important, it's particularly uh, with education. It's very complex. It's the single largest expenditure in state government, $1.7 billion. I think we need someone at the helm that has some management experience. But state law specifically says education. Management. Absolutely. And, and for those who don't understand the process, I think it's important to note uh, it's the state board that is going to uh, be interviewing and uh, taking uh, applications, so to speak, and resumes, and then determining what, what three candidates they're sending to me. Uh, and then I'll choose from those three or send those three back and ask for more. Uh, so I think what they wanted to do, and I appreciate that, they just wanted an idea of what I was looking for. And management experience, I think, should be a part of that package, as well as education experience. Are you specifically looking for someone with, uh, I guess, a non-traditional background for that role? Someone who comes from the private sector, or? Well, again, it could be. Uh, we're just looking for, I just wanted to make sure that we looked broadly, uh, that we made sure uh, that we're thinking outside the box, because you never know. I mean, you could have, like our, our AHS secretary, who's doing a terrific job, uh, who's a rent restaurateur. Uh, have a, uh, a secretary of uh, ACCD, uh, who uh, has a, uh, a master's in education, was a police chief, and, and was involved in technology, and now he's in economic development. Uh, I think that, again, having the right people with the right attitude, uh, with some management experience, uh, would lend itself well. Uh, but obviously, in this position, it's by statute, have to have some education background. But I don't want to preclude anyone uh, from being moved forward uh, that clearly, when I'm looking for management as well. 
in your letter to the legislature a couple of weeks ago outlining the bills that you had objections to, uh, S-260, the water quality cleanup bill, you listed new tax or fee and also separation of powers. Uh, Senator Bray, whose committee wrote that bill, has been seeking an explanation for that from your administration, has gotten one so far. Uh, he consulted with legislative council and they said there was no separation of powers issue in the bill. So I guess, uh, is there an explanation for that? Do well, you or any of the other people? Uh, again, the I, I, I appreciate their counsel and their, their advice uh, to their, uh, to, to their uh, senators, uh, but from my perspective, when a when a bill uh, prescribes that you're going to uh, come up with a fee, uh, that would tell me that they're uh, they're telling uh, the executive branch what to do, uh, and that's not in their purview. If they want to come up with a fee of some sort, just do it. They're the legislature; just pass one. That's not what the bill does, though. I mean, the bill. The bill, the, bill, the bill calls for the, the establishment of a funding, an ongoing funding source for water cleanup, which could be a new fee, in which case it would come I, before the legislature next year. Senator Bray said it could also be budget cuts. I, I don't think what I saw, and I'm going to let uh, these uh, two fine uh, secretaries answer some of this, uh, but I didn't see anywhere where it said it could be. I saw where it said it is, but I'll let them react. Sure. So, um, in particular, in Section 4, and I can hand this to you afterwards, Part B3A3 um, directs the Clean Water Fund Board to uh, determine how a parcel fee or other fee shall be assessed to property owners in a manner that corresponds to the effect of their property on water quality. Uh, it may be that that's a Scribner's error under a heading with, with the flexibility you describe. Um, but that's certainly not the, the way it's written in the bill as passed the Senate, and we flagged that as a concern. Um, this is a copy of the testimony I provided to House Fish, Wildlife, and Natural Resources yesterday outlining those concerns, um, and also sent a copy yesterday morning to Senator Bray, um, so he has them in his possession as well. I, I think it's also important to note that S-260 uh, has left the Senate. It's gone out of committee. It's gone out of, uh, out of the chamber, and it's now over in the House. And now the House is dealing with it, so we're focusing on the House. So, I mean, Senator Bray's point is that he believes that since the Senate passed this bill unanimously on a roll call vote, that the Senate deserves an explanation uh, uh, separate from what's given to the House. And I guess you don't see it that way. Well, I, I can speak to that, John. And I saw your earlier email as well um, questioning uh, why we were not speaking publicly about, uh, the question was why weren't we speaking publicly about our concerns with the bill. I do want to clarify the record. S-260 was started in Senate Natural Resources. Uh, both secretaries, uh, Secretary Moore and myself, and many uh, resources of staff across state agencies testified on the bill um, introduced in Senate Natural Resources. Uh, it then passed out of that committee and was committed to Senate Agriculture. And that was the first time where we had an opportunity to uh, testify about our concerns with the Senate Natural Resources version of the bill. And we testified in the Senate about our concerns of separation of powers and the fee that was in the bill. We reached an agreement, um, compromise with Senate Agriculture. They introduced an amendment on the floor of the Senate that we were um, perfectly fine with and happy with proceeding on, and that amendment was pulled. The current iteration of S-260 has been um, passed. We didn't get an opportunity. Neither Secretary Moore and I, or I were asked about the final version. We are now in the House. Senator Moore testified yesterday on S-260. She's provided written testimony that was given to Senator Bray yesterday morning at 9 o'clock in response to his request to me for our reasoning. He was told on Tuesday I would not be appearing in his committee until S-260 was committed back into the Senate. So uh, we've been speaking very publicly about our concerns with Bill. So thank you. Senator, I just want to follow. You said uh, the bill directs you to do something, but the legislature does that any number of times a year. They order reports that you have to complete, uh, all kinds of things. So how is this different? Di directing for a tax or a fee but it's, is but much, it's, much different. They're asking you to, to come up with a concept of how it can be done. Is that They're asking you to come up with a fee. That's what it says. Okay. And, and so I, would, I would offer you to, yeah, to take a look. 
Uh, and just furthermore on that, um, if you look at the Senate pass version, it totally changes both the composition and the charge of the Clean Water Fund Board, which is made up of five cabinet members currently, whose charge is to um, allocate the Clean Water Fund um, across projects across state government. Uh, the further separation of powers issues in that bill is that it now has the five cabinet secretaries reporting directly to the General Assembly on how to budget that money and completely uh, turns the budgeting process and the constitutional process of the governor to, to present his business to the um, legislature on its head. Speaking of clean water, uh, Governor, do you have any updates about the phosphorus innovation challenge that you uh, discussed last month? Is that something you could get? We do have a few things. Sure. So we, we've continued the um, Agriculture Agency, Agency of Commerce, Community Development, and Agency of Natural Resources have continued to work together to develop um, what we've termed a reverse pitch. We expect to release it within the next two weeks. Um, that initial solicitation will give folks approximately two months um, to submit their ideas. Since we, we first talked about the Phosphorus Innovation Challenge, Secretary Sherling, Secretary Tebitz, and I um, have out, been out doing informational interviews with project developers in Vermont to understand what technologies are sort of under development here, um, where those opportunities exist, and we're really excited about the prospects. Um, our hope would be to announce the, the stage one awards, so those, those successful applicants um, later this summer um, and move quickly towards the, the prototyping and ultimately the construction of these technologies. As you may have seen, there was a report from UVM um, earlier this week that specifically identified this phosphorus imbalance in our watershed as one of the challenges facing us when it comes to water quality, um, making the phosphorus innovation challenge even more timely. And can you remind me, do, does the legislature need to sign off any funding for that program? Not, not for stage one. Uh, stage one, we, we have funding to, to cover those costs. If we get to the stage of, of actually standing up these projects where we may want to make a capital investment, will absolutely need to come back to the legislature um, for that conversation. That hasn't been arrested. It has not. You had a meeting yesterday with uh, Richard Feibe of Coverage Co. Um, any comment, reaction to that, and, and where does that issue stand in your mind, and what do you want to see happen? Yeah, Coverage Co. continues to be a, an issue that uh, we have great concern about, and the loss of, of cell service broadband for uh, those in the uh, southernmost uh, part of the state. Um, it was a, a good meeting, uh, had uh, learned uh, a few more details. They have uh, some uh, resemblance of a plan uh, that they'd like to, with, there's details in the plan uh, that would have to have considerable um, work done uh, in order to complete that. Uh, but as well, on the other side, and I'm not, uh, I can't announce anything at this point, but uh, there are two others uh, who are working on this as well, two other uh, private companies uh, that uh, are going to help us out in the in the interim. So we should have some uh, details on that the next uh, two to three days. I think they were supposed to testify today before our House Committee and they were postponed because of the last time. Uh, coverage. <laughs> <laughs> One of those companies. Um, the state employees are very upset about some changes. I am interested to how the prescription drugs are covered. Um, and they said that you don't understand the amount of pain that it's going to cause. I'm just wondering if you understand that pain and whether or not you're concerned about it. Well, I think it's uh, somewhat unfounded uh, in some respects. Uh, this is uh, utilizing a, a process that's being utilized by most every other New England state and right across the country, uh, as well as uh, even uh, teachers. So this isn't, I think the, the state employees uh, have, uh, have uh, utilized another uh, another approach over the last few years. Uh, this is just bringing uh, it into uh, the same approach that we're taking, or others are taking throughout New England. So I, I don't believe uh, that it uh, provides uh, any undue suffering uh, by any of our uh, state employees. I don't know that it will. Uh, in fact, I think it's going to cost less in the long run uh, with reduce, uh, reduced costs for health care. Uh, that's what we, you know, we discuss this a lot in this building. How do we reduce the cost of prescription drugs? And now we found a path forward to doing so, and I think it will have 
a benefit in the future by lowering the cost of health care uh, throughout. So uh, I, I, uh, I failed to see where, I, I'm not sure that I completely understand uh, what the concern is. Well, these are generic drugs that are replacing the ones that, uh, that they uh, are stipulated. So one of the concerns that I've heard from you, and I have not verified it, is that not all of the brand name drugs on the excluded list have a generic drug to match it. And that, I think, is where some of the major concern is coming from. I'm going to bring that. There, I mean, I know it says either a generic or a therapeutic alternative, but um, I, don't, I think hearing therapeutic alternative doesn't give people much comfort knowing that there isn't a real drug to match what they're taking now. Our Commissioner of Human Resources here, and she can fill in the... Hi, I'm Beth Bastigy, Commissioner of Human Resources. And with respect to that question, um, there would be a process that employees would go to to um, work with the pharmaceutical company and their doctor for an appeal. And that's a practice that is also happens nationwide. And overall, with our current pharmacy um, benefits manager, about 70% of um, those, pe those appeals are actually approved. And the other ones most likely are they, they move on to an alternative and that works for the, that works for the employee. Diabetic test strips? So diabetic test strips would obviously be available to all employees. A particular brand might not be available. So while we might be not providing the employee Kleenex, you might provide them first opportunity would be the Hannaford brand, but if that doesn't work for them, then it'd be a Puffs, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of the same alternative. So employees would obviously be able to get diabetic test strips. Well, the, I mean, the, the list that I saw just didn't say what brand of diabetic test strips, it just said diabetic test strips and the machine that goes with them. Yeah, and that list is a standard list that was provided to the VSEA upon their request. It's not actually the final list that would be, um, that will be the list January 1st when that plan goes into effect and people with diabetes will be able to have test strips <laughs> and test that and test it for, for whatever it needs to be used for. Uh, Governor, the House is now considering the minimum wage for us. Is that a non-starter for you? Uh, is, that, is that something that we're going to be I haven't uh, seen anything uh, that has improved the bill. I still have uh, significant concerns about uh, the overall effects on our economy. Uh, I think it will have a, a, a detrimental effect on our economy, particularly in the rural sections of Vermont uh, and uh, through on the on the eastern uh, border of our state, uh, where we are uh, day in and day out. They struggle to compete with New Hampshire. This will not help. Um, so. Uh, from my standpoint, I want to see uh, more Vermonters make more money. I think that's important, uh, but I think as well uh, that the supply and demand will provide for that, and uh, that uh, that this is just artificially raising uh, the cost of living uh, for Vermonters. So will you veto it if it reaches your um, I would say that if it doesn't make substantial changes between now and then, uh, it could it could see a veto. So are you willing to consider some increase, but not look at that right now? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm saying I think it, ratcheting up uh, this, and I've been part of this. I know I've talked about this in, in our press conferences, but I remember when I was in the Senate and we had this discussion, this debate, and uh, we uh, had the uh, cost of living uh, 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 approved, uh, and some of the de debate was, We'll never have to uh, go through this ever again if we pass this bill. Well, we've gone through it once since, and now we're going through it again. So uh, I believe uh, uh, I'm very concerned about the small businesses of the state, uh, particularly the, the mom and pops, and there are many. I think uh, the figure I saw was 80% uh, uh, of the businesses in Vermont are, are under 25 employees. So this will have a detrimental effect on uh, the businesses as well as uh, the overall economy of the state. What does substantial change mean? I mean, put it back on the shelf? Well, that, that would be a substantial change. I would take that. Uh, what again, is, what's I, a good I, change? I, listen, this isn't sense. my idea. Uh, and, and I uh, believe uh, that if we focus on growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, uh, that we'll have uh, organic wage growth. And uh, that will be a, a positive aspect of, uh, of doing so. So let's focus on how we can make Vermont more efficient 
and uh, let's look for cost savings throughout government so we don't have to raise taxes and fees, and we'll see, we'll see wage growth. So it's been a long time since we have. I mean, through good times and bad over the last, I don't know what it is, 20, 30 years, there's been, you know, the lower, the working and middle classes have lost purchasing power. Um, uh, what makes you think that the economy will suddenly step up and start paying people a living wage? Well, some of it uh, is in regards to uh, the demographics of our state. Uh, we are losing our workforce. We have. Uh, uh, we have fewer people working today than we did uh, uh, seven years ago. And uh, when that happens, uh, and, and you can see it at job fairs, uh, there, there's a lack of people in Vermont, a uh, lack of workers. So when that happens, uh, it's a supply and demand issue. And, and so you have to offer more money in order to uh, get the, uh, the employees that you need. But that doesn't seem to be happening. It is, I believe it is happening. Can you? Uh, can you conceive of a change substantial enough to win your favor? I haven't seen one yet, uh, but uh, we'll see what they come up with. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you coming in.